I'm Kelly Harrell, author, animist, and creator of the Weekly Rune. Solenton Arts is my soul-tending practice, and you're listening to What in the Weird, my podcast in which I talk about runes, actionable animism, soul-tending, and how all of those intersect through sacred activism on my path. Thank you to everyone who listens to the podcast, to those who send notes and share their experiences of the runes. That's what it's all about, and I'm grateful for the engagement. Now, I also want to thank my Patreon supporters who make the sharing of my rune work through the podcast and the RuneCast possible with their financial support. If you've benefited from the RuneCast, the podcast, or the ton of free articles on the runes, animism, and soul tending on my website, you can show your support through buying my books, which you can find at soulintentarts.com or Amazon, by making a one-time contribution through PayPal or Square, or by contributing regularly through Patreon. Just go to patreon.com and search for Kelly Harrell. You can also subscribe to the paid version of The Weekly Rune there, and thank you for it. The Weekly Rune is out, and if you're not sure what it is, it's a runecast that I've done for years, focused on the runic calendar and the current half-month rune. The Weekly Rune is now available in full on patreon.com. Just do a search for Kelly Harrell to find it. And you can find the archive of all past runecasts on my site, soulintentarts.com. If you're not sure what a half month is or what the runic calendar is, listen to the early episodes of What in the Weird, or just go read the weekly rune. It's explained fully at the beginning of every runecast. I want to take a moment to thank the new supporters who've started listening in the new year. It's been great to meet you and get notes from you. And I also want to address that it's been a minute since the last episode. And I've also had people asking if I'm still doing the podcast, if I've wrapped it. And the answer is I'm just doing what I can at any given point right now. I've begun including transcripts of episodes on my website, Soul Intent Arts. Go to the Listen menu option and then What in the Weird podcast transcripts. Getting those finished and uploaded makes things take a lot longer, so there's that. And also, I'm human. I have a family. I have a job. Manage several health conditions and curious neurological wiring all during a pandemic. My priorities have had to shuffle in order to do what I need to do for myself and my family. And part of that has meant I record when I'm able to. So I'm still here. The Weekly Rune is still being produced. And I'll record new episodes for What in the Weird when I can. Thank you for enjoying it enough to ask about it and for being concerned about me. And of course, that feeling of where have all my resources gone is part of our topic for this episode. We've spent the last few months with very clear instruction on how to take care of ourselves right now. The weekly RuneCast has covered this beautiful progression of intentionally reframing our unconscious actively engaging healthy energetic hygiene, being cognizant of embodiment of ourselves, what our external resources are, the the cosmological equivalents of Frithgard and Philia, and our human person boundaries and supports also. I seriously couldn't have picked out better runic combinations than we've gotten intuitively over the last couple of months in the weekly rune. Not just to close the second et for this turn of the wheel, but for quarantine life. At every level of being, the message has repeatedly emphasized how we need to be deeply prepared to take care of ourselves. And I feel like we've been given that message for multiple reasons. The reaction a lot of folks have to that kind of memo is... You know, this is the shit hitting the fan for everybody during COVID, emotionally, physically, spiritually, mentally, 
everybody is managing compact post-traumatic stress right now. Why the hell would we need to take better care of ourselves? Like, why can't we lean on each other? The short answer is because we can't. <laughs> and I know it's a hard time to learn that. Many times in the Weekly Rune over the years, we've gotten the message that learning a new, more functional way to move through life is doable during distress, but it's much harder to do then. That's why we engage in good hygiene habits all the time, not just so we can feel good about having good habits, but so that those habits will be in place to carry us during challenging times and so that we can stand on the benefit they've brought us in having cultivated a relationship with them before duress. But why now? Why exactly now are the runes urging us to step up how we take care of ourselves? I got a few ideas. The first one is, is because it's just time. <laughs> it's time for us to level up our humaning skills to what our current maturity level and emotional needs demand. And this demand may look like a push to accomplish, do, push, 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 but it's more like step back, chill, regroup, ask for support, give support, sleep. Seriously, that's where we are. The basic components of self-care, the, the royalty among which is saying no and setting and honoring our boundaries. And the second one, second reason it's probably one that's going to be upsetting to a lot of people, but the heavy em emphasis to take on more of our self-care is because we've leaned too heavily on our spirit allies. Spirit allies, spirit guides, whatever it is you want to call them, guardians, they're supposed to be anchors that hold a place in the unseen to help us get our shit together here. They have access to resources there that help us make better active choices here. They're like a mystical cheering section that has the capability of weaving threads for us that we can't, don't even know about, or even have access to. They do their end of keeping us together while we do our end. They're not supposed to be these beings who pick up our slack in the formed world. And the idea that that is their job, it's not really our fault. It comes from the projection of being told that we're not enough to curate and tend our own divinity from, from so many different directions, to being told that we need a savior, and the most recent version is the, the 90s guru New Age movement that taught us our spirit allies are a crutch that we go to for everything. They're the fill in the blank of our lives. Coin in slot, pull lever, outcomes, manifestation. The truth is rarely do spirit allies intervene in a life altering way. What's more realistic and an appropriate is a sustained relationship, a joint effort through reciprocity of us offering blessings and gratitude on the regular for them to do what they do on their end while we engage every day in grounded actions that help us to manifest what we need in our lives. We can't get out of the chop wood carry water part of the mundane. But the result is we've relied too heavily on our spirit allies to fill in our blanks. And they can't. They literally can't. It's not their job to. And now, especially now, they're busy. As animists, we understand that chaos that's happening on the earthly plane now is just the physical part of something that's also happening in the spirit world. I'm not saying your allies have forgotten about you. But I am saying that you aren't their top priority right now, and that's how it should be, because we are on top of things on our end, right? The third reason that I feel like the Weekly Runes have been leaning on us, upping our self-care game, is because our dream teams are under duress so much 
that they're likely not our dream team anymore. That's a tough one. We really have to learn how to be functionally self-reliant. And this is a very fitting theme to close this season of the second et. Maybe this is the hardest one. I don't know. Maybe this is harder than the spirit allies one. They're both kind of harsh. So everyone who studies with me, whether it's one-on-one in one of the intensives that I lead or in a live group class, knows that right out of the gate, I ask you to know your dream team. We've talked about this in previous episodes somewhere. I don't remember which one. But your dream team is the community of people who support you, by which I mean human persons. In every study that I teach, I ask that folks make a list of the people on their dream team and note under what circumstances you would contact that person. Like, you know, a ready list. What is this person's role? What's their contact information? And keep it nearby as a primary resource for the time frame that you're in this class. Some people don't take that very seriously. They, they don't yet have the connection that you can't undertake any kind of spiritual or energetic study without changing yourself. And, and in ways that you don't know you're going to change. You, you change how you embody yourself, your cosmology, and every relationship that you're in has to shift to support that. We don't get to pick and choose the parts of our life that are affected by our spiritual studies in healing. And so we need to understand impeccably who we go to and under what circumstances when we need help assimilating how we change with soul work. We need specialists that we trust to help us do that. But of course, this practice to understand who your dream team is and commit to calling on them in times of need works differently when you are alone in crisis, when you're the only one. Compared to now, a time when we are all in crisis including your dream team. They also have to step away now. They also have to have firmer boundaries. They also have families and loved ones to support, you know? I mean, who knew? Who could have truly envisioned a period of time that we would all be unapproachable and deeply taxed to give even the support that might be our profession to do so all at the same time? For that reason, the collective combustion of this, this experience of solo and the end of the second et, is very different. In my experience, the first et is the training wheels portion of being a soul in form. And we close it on a very high note with both the realization that we have an active role that is solely in human person hands to fulfill And with the realization that we have deep spiritual resources to draw on, both way out there and right here. And we still do. When I say that our spirit allies are busy, I don't mean they're gone. I mean they won't respond. I mean think carefully about why you reach out to them and for what reason. What's your expectation of them at this time? Is it reasonable for the work that's on the table for us all? Is it selfish? Because the second et is the crash course in what it's like to be a soul informed, doing your unique happy little dance through life among everybody else doing theirs, that's the challenge. The addition of you plus everyone else changes everything. It changes your dance. It's not so simple as just listen to your unique drum. It's not as clear as get your rhythm. You bump into each other. People may not like your dance and try to stop it. You might not like somebody else's dance. The music changes. It might even completely stop sometimes. Yet dance, we must. It's our job to keep going the best we can without collateral damage to everyone else and without taking them off step. And the third et, holy shit, y'all, the third et starts out in the midst of battle. It starts at the point that mid-conflict, we realize our only option is plan B, which begs the question, what exactly was plan A? 
Plan A was your relationship to the dance. When we sit with ourselves as an animist moving through the world, we eventually realize that in all engagements, there are more components to relationship than just you and the thing. There is you, the thing, and your relationship to the thing, which is neither you nor the thing. It is unique life force. Sit with that for a minute. There's you, the thing, and your relationship to the thing. How you feel about the thing may not be reflected as clearly in how you actually relate to it as you think. You may adore the thing. In in this case, your unique happy dance through life. You may idolize your unique happy dance through life. But what is your relationship to it really? Because the relationship is affected by all those other people doing their unique happy dances to who knows, got awful music, maybe they have no rhythm. And then you have to be like, wait, did I just judge them? Because that judgment factors into my relationship to my dance. We're, we're about to move into Tiwaz. Like where this is all going is we're about to move into Tiwaz, which demands that you get your relationship to your unique happy dance right and right now. That's the plan B. And the timing emphasis of Tiwaz is real. We do not have all day to enact plan B. It's the opening scene of the third ed, and the entire stage is on fire under normal circumstances. To say nothing of what the segue from the second to third ed may be like during a pandemic. This time around with the wheel, Going second to third at transition finds us all having to do that shuffle at the same time, doing that deep personal awakening to our own dance and mining our relationship to it all at the exact same time. It's going to be very interesting to say the least. Messy, I'm pretty sure, but it could also be very beautiful. It could be phenomenal to see a collective come into its own rhythm better because many of us will. We really will because we have been listening to the runes. We've been listening to our own signals and we can do it. We can listen for the point that plan A has to drop. We have to look at the dance, realize it for what it is, realize our relationship to it for what it is and find the beginning of it, the changed version of it, whatever it needs to be all over again. It can be beautiful and many of us are going to do just fine. Go with that thought. Stay with your self-care. Give regular blessings and gratitude to your spirit allies. Shift away from calling on them as much. And instead, bless yourself, bless them, bless your, your Midgard level allies, your Frithgard and Philia. Do the self-work to get out of their way so that you don't complicate their jobs and they can continue doing them at the high level that they do. What's ahead of us in the third et is the movement into the sage's life, which means eldering well. It means we're doing all the things demanded of us at the best level that we can to be self-reliant, to bless our spirit allies in their work, and to make use of and bless our Midgard allies. Because in the third ed, we get the full memo that it's no longer about us. We're going to come through the third ed and see our embodiment and power for what they are, the tools to do it again and again, and to hold space for community to do it again and again. And this time in this pandemic expression of the end of the second et, we can do all of that while remembering our divinity and remembering the divinity of everyone around us. It's all connected. And right now, more than ever, we see the impact that our actions have on one another. It's all connected. The So Willow Half Month Affirmation from Runic Book of Days is all things through you, I am. 
Thanks for listening. If you have questions or insights about working with the runes in season, or you just want somebody to bounce your ideas off, feel free to email me at kelly, that's K-E-L-L-E-Y, at solentinarts.com, or you can call into the Anchor app, which you can download for Android or iPhone. Also, check out earlier episodes by downloading them from Google Play or iTunes and various other podcast platforms. And you can learn more about me, Runic Book of Days, and my work by visiting solentinarts.com or on Instagram at Kelly Soul Arts. I'm Kelly, and this has been What in the Weird.